Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regular council meeting for Tuesday, October 13th. Uh, before we head to the agenda, I'm just going to read a brief announcement. Tonight's meeting is the first since April of this year that is taking place in person as opposed to through the GoToMeeting Zoom style platform. In the past month, children of Wallingford have returned to school in a variety of ways that include in-person attendance. Several of our boards and commissions have resumed in-person meetings. Therefore, it is appropriate that the town council resume in-person meetings. This is a decision that has not been made lightly. We are here with guidance from the town's health and legal departments, as well as in consultation with Scott Hanley of Government TV. When this decision was made, we were experiencing a consistent decline in reported cases of COVID-19. In accordance with the governor's pending executive orders, we are all wearing masks and remaining six feet apart. Disinfectant wipes are available to sanitize areas that will be shared. All of this having been said, we will continue to monitor the numbers of new cases of COVID-19. In the event that we appear to experience a climb heading towards the predicted second wave, we would all agree that it would be wise to resume virtual meetings. With that, please rise for a moment of silence. Have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Fishbein? Here. Laffin? Here. Marone? Here. Morgenstein? Shortell? Here. Ada? Here. Testa? Here. Sandry? Here. Chairman Cerrone? Here. Councillor Morgenstein did advise me that she has a family issue she is dealing with. And we have a motion on the consent agenda, please. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve or accept consent agenda items A through F. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda passes. <clears throat> Item four, there are no items removed from the consent agenda. Item five, public question and answer period. Mr. Morgenstein, I think, behind the mask. Larry Morgenstein, 177 South Main Street. We're still in a pandemic. There's no vaccine. This week we saw five different schools report a COVID case. I really shouldn't even be here tonight. And what I'm, I thought really a lot about what I wanted to say tonight. And I'm gonna tell you my story. Two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with a heart valve problem. And I suffered a rapid decline over the last two years. The pandemic came and it delayed my surgery, and it delayed me getting other information. Turned out not only did I have a valve problem, but I needed a bypass. We couldn't do that because of the pandemic, but a window opened up. And on June 17th, for three hours, machines did my breathing and circulated the blood through my body while they repaired my heart. I'm one of the vulnerable.
There's plenty of people in this town that are vulnerable. There's people in this audience that are vulnerable still. There is risk being here. We're going to have these meetings, and we have other boards and commissions, as you said, that are meeting. I think of planning and zoning. We're looking at Bristol Myers coming up again. This place was filled with people, and they have every right to be here, but they may not be able to. They'd have to choose between their health or the issue of saving their neighborhoods, protecting their property. Even in simple planning and zoning cases, a neighbor may want an addition that affects another neighbor. They may not have a lawyer that could come for them. Again, the choice between health and dealing with an issue. You know I've been here for years coming to these meetings because I take it very seriously that the public should have a chance not only for access, but for participation, we have the capacity. You've demonstrated that. And I don't believe you made this decision lightly. But at the same time, for minimal money, you could still provide that access. I won't be coming back, and I'll be leaving this meeting immediately, and I won't probably be back to participate in any way. Maybe in some ways some of you might feel good about that. Maybe not. I think people know me enough to have some respect for the way I take this. But what I'm asking tonight, not for myself as much as for all the other people too, and the people that are here in this crowd, we have the capacity to do both. If you choose to be in person, you could still offer that opportunity. I'm not asking for just one way or another, but we have the capacity to do both. And I think the obligation to the public, not just for access, but for interacting, is really important, especially since we could do that. And that's really all I have to say tonight. I don't see it as an argument, but I can't be here. And I know other people won't be here either. And I think that's civically a shame and a loss to this community. And I'm asking you, Chairman Cervoni, I'm asking the town council, I'm asking the mayor to do everything that they can. Tomorrow night, there'll be a planning and zoning hearing, public hearing. There's three major issues that I would normally come for, each one important. They're talking about the brothers' parking lot. I have an interest in that, plenty of people do. There's the ongoing issue for the chiropractor, Tracy Melton, at the old Connecticut Bank and Trust. A lot of people have been interested in that. And then there's an environmental issue at Amatech with the old Pfizer property. And anybody who knows me knows that that's of great interest to me and to other people that have filled this auditorium for other environmental issues. I don't think people should have to choose between their health and civic participation. I hope you'll change your mind and do both, even if you feel that the need, because you can, by government orders, it allows for it. I know that. But just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we should. So I won't be seeing you until this pandemic is over. I know that tomorrow's meeting, Gina wanted to testify and say something. They won't read her statement. Mr. Seichter says they don't do that anymore. So her voice won't be heard by the public. It'll be read by the people up on the dais but it won't be public. I really have nothing more to say other than you have the power to change this and do both if you insist on being in person. But Mr. Morgan, no I'm, I'm glad your heart surgery was successful. Great, thank you. 
Anyone else? With that, we will close the public question and answer period and move on to item six on the agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve in a, a budget amendment appropriating $604,500 from retained earnings into capital operations accounts for the electric division. These amounts are to cover additional expenses incurred and the restoration of damages caused by, caused by Storm Isaias in August of 2020. That'll be $91,000 to the distribution plant line transformers $3,000 to the transformation, transmission load dispatching line, $30,000 to the distribution load dispatching line, $430,000 to the distribution maintenance overhead lines, $20,000 to the distribution maintenance miscellaneous distribution line, $5,000 to the customer records expense, $24,000 to the employee pension and benefits line, and $1,500 to the maintenance of general plant line. Second. Moved and second. Good evening, Mr. Bukiri. What do you have for us? This just uh, as was stated, uh, this is, we're seeking uh, an amendment and appropriating. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, we're here to seek a budget amendment uh, to appropriate $604,500 um, from retained earnings uh, back into the uh, original uh, electric division budget. Um, it was early on in the fiscal year, so we had the funds available um, to execute and, and uh, the storm, and, and now we're just seeking to replenish that budget. Thank you. Uh, questions from the council? Councilor Fishbein. Good evening, sir. Um, focusing on line, the um, customer records expense, it's my understanding from the backup that embedded in there is overtime costs. Is that correct? Correct. I, I've never seen overtime costs put into a line, a customer records expense line. Is that, is that common? Uh, this is for, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, this is for our customer service reps that actually uh, man the storm center. We, we set up a call center. They answer phone calls and input all the data into our outage management system. So those, that's, it's the overtime budget for those folks, correct? So is the, is the overtime budget for those folks usually shown in that line. So when we, um, we call it a customer records expense, it's by definition something more than maintaining actual physical records or gaining physical records. It's, it's the uh, personnel operations as well. Is that fair to say? Now, the um, employee pension and benefits line, the $24,000 expenditure, I would expect that that's directly tied to that overtime expense because overtime went up, the pension went up also. Correct. Just a weird way of accounting. We, we actually account for employee pensions in the employee pension line. But we don't account for the overtime in a line that says overtime. Is that, I mean, is there is there a way to un, unpack the that customer records expense, is it just overtime or is it other things in there? Straight time, overtime, and supplies is in that line. Uh, stationary envelopes, billing forms, that type of thing are all under that account 903. The divisions. Accounting is slightly different from the way the general fund accounts for things. As I understand, the general fund may have an, a line for overtime and a line for labor. Our labor is split among a variety of accounts and the overtime among the, those same accounts, straight time and overtime. I understand how we end up. It's just it's very difficult for the public to look at a budget, look at a report where a 
line says, you know, is titled customer records expense, but we find out that there's, you know, retention of records, the expenses for that is in that line. Apparently, straight time for employees is in that line. Apparently, at least overtime is in that line. And it's, it's very difficult for somebody. So just why is it structured that way? Our accounting is kept in conformance with the Connecticut Uniform System of Accounts. That's what we're required by charter, uh, actually, to, to account for our funds in that manner. I believe water and sewer has slightly different accounts, but they also have a uniform system of accounts that they have to follow. And who establishes that accounting system? Uh, the Connecticut Department of Public Utilities initially established that they're now part of Pura Department of uh, Energy. Okay, thank you. Um, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Questions from the public? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Fishbein? Yes. Laffin? Yes. Marone? Yes. Shortell? Yes. Tata? Yes. Testa? Yes. Sandry? Yes. And Chairman Savoni? Yes. And the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. On to item seven. Mr. Civitelli, please present your update on COVID-19. Good evening. Good evening. I guess I'll get started like we normally do by um, going over some of the numbers and then I, there's a couple of things I just wanted to kind of talk about. So uh, as of right now, we're looking at a total of 600 cases in town. Um, the split initially over the last several months has been 50-50 between uh, nursing homes and community cases. But as of right now, um, the community cases have obviously overtaken nursing homes at this point. Um, so we're looking at 62% for community cases to 38% in the nursing homes. Uh, so that basically telling us that the nursing homes at this point are in much better position than they had been in the past. Over the last few months, we've seen numbers vary, but just to give you some perspective, uh, by month, August, we had 24 cases, September 33, and so far for the month of October, we've had 20. The issue that we're running into when collecting data is it, it seems that state of Connecticut is adjusting up or down some of our numbers after the fact. Um, so we try and categorize things by month. Uh, and then it seems like when we go back and run reports for the previous month thereafter, there's a slight deviation. I'm sure you saw last week there were several thousand tests that had to be adjusted, which impacted the positivity rate. So I think what we're seeing is when you're doing the volume of testing that we're doing in the state, uh, last week we did roughly 150,000 tests in the state of Connecticut. Um, there's some issues not only with processing that but also reporting it. So I think that's something that we're seeing right now. Uh, from the beginning of the pandemic till now, we have roughly 12,434 individuals. Individuals were actually tested in town, which is 27% of our total population. Um, when you're looking at um, as a percentage, how many people have tested positive versus our uh, population numbers, 0.82% of our total community uh, tested positive. Over the last several months, we had 28,290 negative tests here in town, just to give you a general, yes. Can, can I just ask you to say that positive number again, was it 0.82 or 0 0.02? 0 0.82. So thank you. Yep. Um, so just for, and again, some of the data, I'd like to have it more current um, in some cases, but some of the, like I said, due to the, some of the state reporting, it lags. Um, from 926 to 103 in town, we had uh, 1,928 tests with a positivity rate of 0.7. Um, so another uh, data point we've used over the last several weeks is a seven day rolling average. Um, something that we're seeing more now is the state seems to be converting over to a 14 day rolling average, but I want to continue to use a seven day rolling average. Um, right now our seven day rolling average is 4.8 cases per day uh, from the week of September 27th to October 3rd. 
Um, that puts us right in line with New Haven County numbers, which are 4.7, which is still considered considerably low when you're looking at community transmission. We did have uh, two fatalities in nursing homes since our last meeting three weeks ago. Um, and we have 15 uh, patients currently at the Quinnipiac Valley COVID-19 recovery unit that, we've, that was established uh, quite some time ago. As of right now, we're still running contact tracing efforts as one would imagine, uh, seven days a week, trying to identify cases in the schools and other areas in the community. As of right now, we have 14 individuals that we're monitoring for a 10-day window. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is cases related to gatherings and familial spread. So mom or dad test positive and the subsequent people in the home are testing positive thereafter. So that seems to be the general consensus at this point. Uh, we're continuing to still work with Board of Education and, and CHOAT. Um, I have some numbers here for CHOAT. As of October 11th, uh, they've conducted 2,220 tests on campus. As of right now, they have zero positive cases. Uh, they're still quarantining. I think they're just about ready to get out of quarantine uh, for the individuals who arrive back to campus. Um, at this point, uh, really, when you're looking at the, the way the state is going overall, I did want to um, point out that I'm sure many of you heard of the town alerts that are going to start being instituted statewide. Uh, an example was Norwich and New London recently, where it was found that their 14-day rolling average was, in New London's case, 30.5, and in Norwich's case, 46.9. Um, there was a town alert. And I guess based on those alerts, they recommend certain measures be in place. Um, there's still a draft form of what the recommendations would be. We're trying to evaluate what that actually would mean if we ever were put on that list. Um, just for some perspective, so just to compare us to, to the, those two towns, again, New London was 30.5, Norwich was 46.9, and, and fortunately at this point we're at 3.7. So we're staying under that five cases per day, which seems to bring you to the next threshold. We're considered what's known as a level zero. Uh, level one would be between five and 10 cases per day. Level two would be between 10 and 15, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, as far as that could, and we're concerned there, that seems to be the path that um, we might be taking moving forward. Phase three, uh, Reopening started October 8th, so we're 75% capacity in restaurants. I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the changes that have been made. Um, we're trying to monitor the reopenings with the cases and how we react to that as a community. Um, and then just one last thing of note, uh, recently I was asked to uh, sit on the Governor's Vaccine Advisory Task Force, which there's 21 members. I think that puts us in a good position as a town for us to have a person actually in that room um, listening to what's going on, helping making the policy decisions, hopefully. And um, I think that's kind of where we are at this point as a town. We're just trying to monitor everything as best we can to try and get a grasp on where cases are and get to those quickly so that we could identify the situation and try and isolate the people before it becomes a greater issue. Um, but that's kind of where we are from the numbers at this point. Is it safe to say that you accepted the governor's appointment? That is, that is true, I did. Okay. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, if you're one of 21, and we have, I think, 161 towns or something, uh, that says something. So thank also, you. congratulations, and I'm sure we will be well represented, and the committee will be well served by your presence. Thank you, I appreciate it. The first meeting is tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Excellent. We'll look forward to hearing about that. Um, I have questions from Councillor Shortell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Marone, your head's in my way. Um, thanks for laughing at that, Barbara. Uh, Mr. Civitelli, thank you for being here. Uh, is it safe to say, based on your update, based on the numbers that you provided, that as of now, then, you feel things are as under control as they can be. So we're not, are you saying if we went to level one, that would 
initiate what? What would you do differently, or what would the what would be different if you came to us in two weeks and it was a yeah. level one? I guess. That's a great question, and I think that a lot of us in public health we're trying to balance. It seems at this point we've resided to the fact that this there's going to be a certain level of background in the community that there's there's going to be short of a pharmaceutical intervention. This is going to be around for quite some time. Um, I guess the question becomes to what extent. So I think the state's trying to set thresholds for alerts, but I still even think that the numbers that they're trying to set that by are somewhat flexible. Um, I heard today at the governor's conference that uh, we will soon be on our own travel advisory list. What does that mean? Um, because as a state, we're roughly at seven cases per day, um, over 100,000 rolling average, so the question became, Maybe is that threshold going to increase? Will that be 15 as opposed to 10? Um, but I think that the guidance for the uh, town alert, they give you some thresholds. So if we hit five, they recommend, you know, um, talking more about, you know, masking, other prevention methods in the community, which is something that we've been doing all along. But if, you know, for some way we, you know, had to step it up. It seems that more of the critical threshold seems to be when you hit right around 20, 15 to 20 cases per day. And I've thought about this a lot in that, how do we measure how well we're doing versus March and April? And when you go back to March and April, we were really only doing 400 tests per day. And now we're roughly averaging around 13,000 tests per day. So it's really hard to see. I remember before we used to say, you know, you couldn't get a test. You couldn't find someone. If you were sick, you had to really be sick to get a test. Now we're testing asymptomatic people at home, you know, long-term care facilities. It's really hard to gauge where we're going to be as a community. I, I would expect that if we could maintain some of the levels that we have right now, as we've seen through, you know, August, September, October. But my assumption is, is that, you know, as we retreat indoors more, the cases would, would continue to rise to a certain extent. The question is, is how, how high? So along those lines, uh, we've had some, as a parent, I get the Board of Ed, as many of us do, the Board of Ed emails. Uh, there was an article in the paper about that, and then we had another, there was another email that came out like the day the article ran. So I, we've had, a, it looks like a, a bunch of cases at Moran. Um, is there a situation brewing at, in the school system? Because it feels like in the last several days, we. Yeah. We, we, we started school, I think, September 1st or something like that. And we got to a point where I think we had, I think I, we had like six cases. And then in the last four days, I think we've had six more. So is, no, there, a great, a, is there a concern about the school system? Not at this point. The way we're, and see, that's where the contact tracing really comes in. And, and what typically happens is, you know, because we're looking at it seven days a week, when someone takes a test, whenever it's reported, that's when we react to it. So, um, your scenario, so we had a situation arise on Friday, uh, and then when I was here on Sunday, we had a similar situation that arose. And what I could say about th those cases in particular is that there was an in-home family person that had the virus that in turn prompted um, other people in the residence to be tested. And I think that's really what we're seeing is a symptomatic person in the home, and then you have individuals who are attending school that therefore then are being tested and some of those are coming back positive. So I think that that's really what's leading to that. What I'm really looking for in the schools is that if student A and student B in the same cohort end up testing positive. So if we could identify one person, remove them, take that cohort offline, and then push forward, that's the plan, not really set forth by, by us, but by State Department of Education. The real question that Dr. Menzo and I have had is we're just w looking for that relationship between multiple students in the same cohort testing positive. Then that's something that we know there's, it's spreading within the classroom, right? So that seems to be the, the measure. That was my next question. You just answered my next question because I know in Dr. Menzo's email, he said, oh, it's not happening at the schools. And, and I was like, well, how do you know it's not happening in the schools? So that's how we know. It's great. At this point, and actually, um, all the cases that are in the schools, we report to State Department of Education. Yep. Um, and I think Dr. Menzo and I, uh, our opinion from the, very, uh, from the beginning was to be as transparent as possible what was going on in the schools. So we send out two letters every time there's a case. One letting the district know, and then a supplementary one to those who are directly impacted by it. Um, so the process 
that's in place is working to a certain extent. We're identifying issues, and before they can impact a larger school facility, we're, you know, um, quarantining that cohort. Is there a potential for transmission that we have, has yet to be seen? You know, the hope is is that the mitigation methods in place, the distancing, the masking, the increased cleanings, the ventilation, all those measures will help mitigate it to a certain extent. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, is here we are. Uh, are we, this, is this okay, what we're doing? Would you recommend anything else? No, I, I spoke with Chairman Cervoni about this, and I think that um, if we start to see increased community cases where we get to the point where we can't identify where they are, um, a large portion of our cases for the month of October were actually from a single event in town um, where we actually found out that there were relationships with multiple individuals that ended up impacting the schools as well. So it's one of those things where if we're doing, if we're identifying where everything's coming from, that's a good thing. It's when I can't wrap my arms around it and it, there's no way where I could trace it back, then that's when, where we were back in April and, and May, early May, where it just was so widespread at that point, then you have true community spread. As of right now, it seems like it's okay. fairly steady. I just, yeah. I just don't want this, in, you know, we have, you know, older counselors like Councillor Fishbein who yeah. are more at risk. I don't want to put, put them. Um, last question is uh, more of a, I don't know, national, I don't know if it's a national question, like with a vaccine, you know, where are we, have you heard or in your travels I think you and I had a discussion a little while back where we talked about, you know, vaccine in the beginning in the first quarter of 2021, but, but like the average person wouldn't get it till the spring at earliest because it's, it's essential personnel. Is that still what we're tracking to or do you? Yes, and um, my hope is, is that me sitting on that advisory group will highlight some more things that I could bring back here. But essentially, uh, the long and short of it as of right now, they're still looking at phase one critical infrastructure for the... Um, critical infrastructure workers at some point, maybe this year, early next year. Um, we identified the critical infrastructure workers here for town. Um, and then phase two would be general population rollout, which appears to be uh, more of the larger facilities, healthcare facilities that would be administering it. Uh, the health departments uh, being tasked with doing it for our critical workforce. So at this point, obviously you read in the news that there's been a couple setbacks with the vaccines and that's why Personally, this is uh, my opinion of it is, is that, you know, we have non-pharmaceutical interventions right now, and that's what we're going to have, the distancing, the masking, the increased cleanings. That's what we have to stick with right now. And um, I really think that the vaccine is important, but also the therapeutics. And it seems that there's been some advances in antibody therapies that uh, hopefully can become more readily available to mainstream, which I think would be just as helpful where... Um, it would help the um, reduce the risk of, of more you know, mortality, which I think would be crucial moving forward. So I think that we focus a lot on the vaccines, but I think the therapeutics is, an antiviral would be just as useful. Well, thank you again for everything you're doing. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Mr. Spitelli. How are you? Hi. Um, the two nursing home fatalities, are you able to tell us where, which nursing home those occurred in? Quinnipiac Valley Center. Okay, so that's my, that's been my concern is, um, and I think way back when this first started, I was very concerned with that, the recovery center being there, and we talked about that. Um, you know, we heard a lot about New York and how people were put into the nursing homes and it caused, you know, deaths in the nursing homes that didn't need to happen because these people were put in there. Um, so. Am I right that the, the state is basically who is controlling that, the recovery center portion Correct. of that? Correct. So what, what is your role or the town's role in that? Do we have, I'm sure you know what's going on there and how are they keeping uh, staff and patients uh, separate? So they're still, so they have roughly 15 individuals. A lot of those individuals, uh, I was told was from a sister agency that ran into some issues um, in other parts of the state. Um, what I could say about the facilities is that if you, the way I understood the testing mechanism, which has been key to uh, 
identifying issues in the long-term cares, which wasn't, be, wasn't being done early on when we had a lot of fatalities, is that if you have 14 days uh, with, without any positive tests in the facility, then they go to every month they'll do testing. Um, but, I, but what we're hearing now is they're gonna, the state is thinking about with the increased uh, cases statewide, they're gonna continue to do testing in the nursing homes, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, because that's the vulnerable population that was impacted the most. We still reach out to our facilities and check in. Um, our public health nurse just reached out to um, Skyview, uh, Masonic, Gaylord, and uh, in Quinnipiac Valley Center recently just to get an idea of where their PPE stock levels were. Um, our understanding is the state told them basically now that the supply lines are somewhat um, available that they should have 30 days of PPE on site as opposed to requesting assets from the town. Um, so I think that as far as that goes, they're all meeting that requirement. Um, but yeah, at, at this point, we interject when we feel that we need to if we can. I know we interjected early on um, in April and um, I'm hoping that that led to some of the changes that were made with the National Guard in late April. But as of right now, um, Regency, Skyview, uh, some of the other facilities are, are doing fairly well. Okay, and um, do you know if the staff at Quinnipiac Valley, do, does the recovery center portion have separate staff? Or are they crossing over? No, the understanding was that that was still gonna, the original plan was to stay in place that they were gonna have separate staff. Okay. Yeah, unless that's changed, uh, we haven't been notified of that, but initially it was two nurses in that facility that were gonna be designated for that. That wing was empty for a short period of time in the summer and then with the recent resurgence, I think that they're seeing some step downs from hospitals, but as it was told to me by their administrator that um, a lot of those uh, patients were from other sister facilities. Okay. Yeah. And they're, are they able, I'm assuming they're, I think back months ago when we talked about this, they, they chose to have that in their center, correct? I think that they received money from the state to have that center. That was my correct? understanding, correct. Okay. I'm, I know you're doing everything you can. I, I know it's not, the town is kind of out of it, but um, that's concerning that the two, very concerning to me, the two fatalities were there. Um, again, just looking at what happened, I know we, you know, we hear a lot about New York and the nursing homes and, um, you know, if I had family there, I'd, I'd be very concerned. And um, so, you know, thank you for, for checking up on it. But um, unfortunately, I, that's, you know, that, that's concerning. But. Um, yeah, I guess that's all we can do. Is it, it definitely is, and I think that um, clearer lines of uh, who's responsible for what has been designated at these facilities. So if, and the, with the frequent testing, the hope is, is that it, it wouldn't get to that point. Yeah. Um, but I think we know how it happened. Lack of PPE early on, infected workers coming in. Um, and now if we could identify the infected workers, the affected patients quicker. You know, it, it mitigates it. It's just like, you know, I, I think that that's kind of where they are right now, but I think that we'll continue to, to reach out to them and see if there's anything that they need. Okay, um, thank you. As we have, it's, it's hard to, t I don't know, personally, I don't know the um, condition of the individuals that passed prior. Right, yeah. Um, so again, it's, uh, there's a lot of information that we don't get. Yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah, thank you for just keeping, you know, keeping tabs on it, I guess, as much as we can. And uh, that was all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Zandri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so I, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, like I have, I go, I write as fast as you can give them to me the numbers, but I mean, so our seven day rolling average is 4.8 cases a day, you had said, is that correct? That is correct. That was as of October 3rd. Yeah, as of October 3rd. So. It, it, it's kind of like you identify, we're starting to creep up like we see elsewhere in the state, but nowhere near as bad as some parts of the state. I would agree. So we have, we have communities that are worse. And you talked a little bit about the testing between like April over October. There was, there was far, far fewer tests back then. You know, and, and you know, we look at, you know, I, I have some numbers back from when you gave them to us back in June. And you know, we, we had 24 confirmed cases in June. 
we've got about 20 right now at this point in October, it being the 13th, maybe we double it before the end of the month. So it's going to be definitely more than June, but we've got a lot more testing capability right, right. now. So I, I think that's important to let people know, like when, when we're speaking about the concerns of the schools and are, are we having an impact of having students together? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very important to kind of continue to emphasize that with each positive case that we find, that we're able to basically backtrace, you know, with a, good, with a good degree of certainty in most cases, not all, it's not a perfect system, Correct. where that came from. So, in, in it's kind of like you outlined. So far, it hasn't been because of, you know, the same cohort or, you know, and it's been family, it's been a gathering, it's been a social event where, where people, for lack of a better way to say it, got, got too far back to normal too soon. Maybe they were con congregating around, you know, you know, the chips and dip or whatever the case might be, and they're, they're too close together, they're not wearing masks, and they're within six feet. So I, I guess I say all of this because, you know, a lot of people push back real hard. You know, why, why are we not on phase four yet? Why are we not doing X, Y, and Z yet? And, and, I, and I try to stress balance over everything else because as we kind of edge into, you know, into phase three, and then, you know, we may have to pull back to phase two, um, you know, depending on, on how, how drastic things get. Um, I, I also like to identify there's, there's different circuit breakers in certain systems. Like, like for the example, we were talking about the schools. We're going to reach a point of winter break. That's a solid break in time where you get people that are normally together that won't be. And that, that will be a divisional separation just by the holiday break. Now, people will be around their own families, but pretty much they'll be you know, indoors together. There's a lot of social events that are not canceled. So I guess where I'm going with all this is I, I, don't, I want people to stay informed with the information that you give us and the information that comes out. But I, I don't want people to overreact or panic. I mean, one of the first things I saw the past couple of days when, when, the, when these numbers of cases per day started coming up, I'm not sure where people were getting some of the numbers from. They were more exaggerated than what you just gave us. But, but they start to inflame. These are people are like, we should be closing schools, we should be closing this, we shouldn't be doing that. I, I don't, I'm not suggesting we may never get back to that point if it really gets to be a truly true second wave of it. But I, I want people to, to approach it cautiously, everything that you do, and, and maybe to prepare in a situation like that. But I don't want to, I, I want people to understand there's a lot more testing now. So if the, if the positivity rate actually ticks up, it's because we're testing 10 times the number of people. And we're probably catching some that were there before that never got discovered. People were sick, they went home, whatever the case might be. They maybe never went to the doctor, they got better at home or whatever, you know, whatever. When I get, when I've gotten the flu in the past, I don't go to the doctor. I'm sick enough, I know it's the flu, so I don't go. I'm not a statistic that year, but I probably had the flu. This is much more critical, much more dangerous, and people should get tested. But the point that I'm trying to make here is with a lot more testing and not a huge increase in showing that folks are positive, I think that's a positive thing. But I, I'm going to kind of give it to you and ask you, do you, do you feel, because maybe, you know, my, my layman's understanding of it is going to be different than like your expertise. If we're testing 10 and 15 times the number of people than we were three to four months ago, and we're not seeing much of a change in the, in the total numbers of confirmed cases, does that bode good? Should I not be looking at the information like that? Can you help me with that a little bit? Yeah, and I think... Um like we say in the office, negative is positive these days. And, um, but the thing that I'm trying to, we, what we're trying to figure out is that, you know, when you see the numbers from positives from today, it could be a symptom of something that happened a month ago. You know, it has, takes 14 days to amplify in the community, then you have time within the household for that to spread within the household and then come out into the community. So, um, you know, some of the numbers that we saw late September, early October were of the belief that it, it's a result of what we saw on Labor Day. So moving forward, we're going to try and hit these markers like Halloween, Thanksgiving, all the holidays that are coming up that we really didn't have to contend with before and trying to see what impact, if any, that has. Um, you know, 
for have, being at phase three and, you know, assuming that the cases stay as steady as they are right now, I, I would assume that we'd end the month with somewhere close to 50, maybe 60 cases, unless we have a, something brewing that we just don't know about, um, which is always the case, right? We, you know, if the, there was a, an event in town that we had several cases at that caused the issues in the community and the school, which had multiple impacts. Um, if we're able to identify those cases earlier, you know, or people stayed home, um, if they didn't feel well, that would be another thing. But the numbers are hard to, to use only. It's, I try and look at it, how quick they're rising. Um, so it, the, if you asked me a week ago, because October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, it seemed like we had a, a lot come in. And then it slowed down, and then the more came in. So I don't know if it's the reporting from the state with the number of tests they're doing, um, but I know that a lot of people are being tested here in town frequently. Like I said, we had 1,900 tests roughly a week ago. So there's ample testing out there, but I think with ample testing, we'll also have a, a general understanding of where we're going. Um, but I do think it's a balance. We're, Great, thank you. And, and I, have, I have a follow-up too. So I, I want to try to get a better understanding of, of you know, we, we've been talking about as people do become infected or test positive and, you know, they do the quarantine and all of that. With the contact tracing, this basically means you can go back from the person and, and find out where they got it from. Now, more or less, correct. is that correct? So I'm, I'm curious if, if there's any number whatsoever where, where it's a total unknown. I mean, what's the a percentage of somebody saying like, somebody coming in and going, I don't know where I got it. I was at my cousin's, none of them are sick. I got it so-and-so and, you know, nobody there was sick because that leads me to believe there's, you know, there's that segment of people that, that get sick or carriers that never, never have any symptoms, never get sick. And, but then there's no way to know unless that entire family got tested. And I'm also curious because, you know, with the early, early on in the, in the pandemic, there was a, there was a lot of, I, I don't want to use the term over exactly. There was a lot of focus on, on um, surfaces. Wood carried it longer than paper and metal did this. And, and we've been sanitizing everything for six months now. So do, do we have any type of numbers that we've got that might be from actual surface contact or are they, the main transmitter is still people to people? The, the, and I, you know, we check it frequently, but CDC updated some of their, how does the disease spread? It's still primarily person to person. Um, it's, you know, it's not as likely from surfaces to people. Um, I think we'd recognize that it's like any other virus. It could survive different time frames depending on the environment. Um, obviously, the outdoor environment, it doesn't do as well. But um, I think at this point, yes, we, we do have cases that we, we can't pinpoint it, but it's not to the point where we were in April and May. Um, more or less, when we talk to several individuals, and we could identify where they, where they believe or they knew somebody who had it first and then they contracted it from that person. Um, but I don't have a set number as to how many people at this point. I haven't quantified it that way, um, but that's something we could certainly look at. Well, I guess, I, you know, again, I guess for me, I, I, I look at it like we're all of us, you know, whether it's businesses, individuals, we're probably all doing the right things by, you know, the school systems, businesses, you know, public transportation, wiping things down repetitively between runs and, and all of that. And, and I think that only helps. I don't think it, I, you know, I don't want to suggest, oh, let's throw our hands and we don't have to wipe these types of surfaces down anymore. But I, I, I want to be able to make the case to people to say, look, it's still people to people. We should be wiping all these things down and taking care of what we're touching and handling and how we're doing it. But it's still that person to person contact. If you if you must interact with other people, keep the six feet. And I've, I've gotten into arguments with people, well, it's farther than six feet. Well, then make it 12. Wear the mask and then make it 12, too. I mean, if you're in a room with a bunch of Italian folks like my family, we could be 30 feet apart. We're going to hear each other just fine. But, but the idea is that I think people get too, they get overcautious sometimes. Like, well, everything's wiped down, so we're good, and we could be more comfortable. I, I you know, I, I want to, I guess the message is stay vigilant, I guess, right now until, until we can get to a better position. But I don't want people to feel like, oh, I can't handle that box because somebody else handled the box and they didn't wipe it down because that's a low transmission rate. So I, you know, I, I want people to, to kind of maintain that 
It's still the person to person spread. This is why the masks are important. Uh, you know, when you do go to a restaurant and you're at the table and you're eating, if you're gonna get up just to go to the restroom or step outside to make a phone call, put the mask on to go outside. Then when you step clear, you can take it off. Just to kind of rem remind everybody of that and to kind of keep that information out. So I kind of wrap that piece of it up. I, again, that goes back to why I've, I really, I'm, and we all do, we all really appreciate the amount of information that you're able to give us uh, at, all, at these meetings. Because it allows us to go back out to the people we talk to, get it to directly to them. I know you put it on the website for the town too, that, uh, you know, these updates. And that, you know, it, it, it helps get the information out. We, get, we cut through the noise and get the data. So I, I really do appreciate it. I thank you so much for the effort that you're putting in, for the job you do here and what you're doing above and beyond. I, I can't thank you personally enough for, for, on behalf of the town. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Councilor Shortell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, one last question. Please. Um, how do we handle teacher safety? Uh, in terms of, okay, so I, I thought your point about when, when two children in the same cohort both get test positive, that's when alarm bells start going off. And so far that hasn't happened. But what about the teachers? I mean, not that the teachers test positive, but that they have students of theirs who are testing positive. Or what do we, do we have a plan in place for that? And yes. the specific reason I'm asking is there was stuff floating around social media earlier about a specific grade at one of the middle schools, or one of the middle schools, where teachers were all saying they were going to be out for two weeks. So, so um, typically, what happens is if we identify even a teacher that was impacted by the, either a student or vice versa, that that teacher would be treated the same and would be quarantined for the 14 days. Um, so we've dealt with multiple scenarios at this point, but we would treat them all the same as we'd look at the cohort. We'd identify the close contact. And to be perfectly honest, we're relying on the nursing staff, um, you know, the superintendent's office to, to provide us with some information about what, what cohort it is, what the situation is, and then we give advice as to what, how we believe they should move forward. Um, to this point, we've managed, aside from the one situation at DAG, to keep the schools open because we do have the defined cohorts and they've been doing what, very well with keeping them tight in that you know there hasn't been any breakdowns in the system to our knowledge um, so we've been able to allow people to still function in the facility without any other issues so um, but yes we would treat the teachers the same if, if they had if they had exposure thank you that's all i have thank you mr Chairman. thank you any other questions from the council questions from the public uh, well mr civitelli it's pretty clear that um you came into your position and shortly thereafter your position became more than a full-time job and uh, you're more than living up to it and so I am very grateful for the work you're doing for the town and grateful for the time you spend with the council for the benefit of the public. And I appreciate everybody's input here and their, everyone's questions. Um, I, you know, I, I'll entertain any questions and, and provide as much information as I can as we're moving forward. But. Um, I think, you know, one thing, we'll always be honest with what we're seeing. And again, the only struggle that we have really at this point is trying to, as to, to your point, understand the data and where that means we could be going. So as long as, you know, we're trying to monitor that as best we can so we could give the best advice. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, can we have a motion to go into executive session? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move we go. It's, no. Say no. Attorney Farrell's here. I move we go into executive session pursuant to section 1-206D the Connecticut General Statutes with respect to the purchase, sale, and or leasing of property. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare the council in executive session. Kindly clear the chambers.
Call the meeting back to order. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There being no further business on this agenda, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed can stay.